Welcome to our service tonight. Glad you're with us on this Wednesday night. Let's all stand. Let's sing out tonight. Page 70 if you need it. The unclouded day. Let's sing it out. Oh, they tell me I'm a whole far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me I'm a whole far away. Oh, they tell me I'm a whole when the storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me I'm an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. say amen. 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 Hallelujah. That was a good one. Say it again. Amen. Oh man, what a blessing that is just to be able to hear somebody say amen. Amen. You, hey, you may be seated. How many of you had a great day today? Raise your hand. You had a great day. How many of you just had a good day? How many of you had a day? Amen. Well, you know what? I'm glad that we're here in the house of the Lord. Let me encourage you. Um, if uh, Continue to pray for Pastor and Brother Zach. And uh, they are traveling back from the Beams Conference there in Mississippi. Be traveling tomorrow. So be praying for them and also be praying for me. I'll be preaching. Amen. We got the, we got the, uh, the third string up tonight. And so uh, looking forward to that. Do be praying for me. But thank you so much for being here. And the folks that are listening on radio and uh, YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. We just want the Lord to be honored and glorified. We're going to have a great time in the house of the Lord. Amen. Absolutely. Let's sing this. Well, let's hear a great song being sung. Amen.
church one more time turn to page 64 in your hymn book if you need it let's sing lead me to calvary
Lord is good, isn't He? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's offering time. Amen. Well, some of you remember. All right, ready? Let's do it again. It's offering time. Amen. amen. Amen and amen. Thank the Lord for that, how He has provided for us. And uh, let me give you a couple of uh, prayer requests just real quick. As I said earlier, uh, Pastor and uh, Brother Zach's going to be traveling. Also, uh, for uh, Brother John um, Andres, and, 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 and Andreas, thank you. Um, he had his knee surgery on Monday, and everything is good to go. So continue to be praying for him. That is a true blessing. I talked to Miss Ramona yesterday about Brother Jerry. You know, he had a stroke, and uh, they moved him from one facility, and they moved him on down. Continue to pray for him, but he is doing better. She said he's, he's, he has some movement there in his left arm, which uh, when I saw him last, he did not. Um, also, he is able to eat puree food, which is a hallelujah, praise the Lord, for that as well. And uh, so he is able to get up with a walker and using that left leg a little bit better. So I can tell you that is an answer to a lot of prayers. So be, be praying uh, for the Hans family, Brother Jerry, what a blessing they are. And uh, just uh, they want to move back here, but at this time they just can't. they got to be with their, uh, with their children, uh, taking care of them. So be praying for those folks. And uh, so I believe we have Brother Joe's going to be praying for the offering. And our choir's going to come down. We're going to just uh, go around and shake hands and uh, just greet one another. Brother Joe. Heavenly Father, thank you for that, Lord, for who you are and what you, what you are to us. We thank you, Father, for being our Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for being able to come into your house. And, Lord, to be able to praise you and worship you. Help us tonight to listen to Brother Donnie as he preaches your word. Open our hearts, and may we uh, accept what you have for us and apply it to our hearts and lives. Lord, bless the offering now. Lead God and direct us in all that we do. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.
let's sing this out. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy. be seated. Miss Wanda, if you would, please take your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Brother Mike asked me if we were going to be done around 7.30. (laughs) Nope. No, I I, I told him, I said, I'll be honest with you, I really like to try to preach for about 30 minutes uh, and no more, but usually when I try to preach shorter I preach longer so I'm going to try to preach longer <laughs> I'm just kidding. hey man hey it's it's Wednesday and so I understand you guys have been at work we've all been at work it's been a long day 
And I, I tell you, it's such a blessing. Um, how many of you say it's hard to get to church on Wednesdays? You'll be honest. It, it is. It, and I just live right over there. I mean, it's hard. But it, it is, man. You're tired. And, uh, but don't, don't you know whenever you come into the house of the Lord, something happens. And God empowers you. And I'm so very thankful for that. Uh, Brother Sexton, you know, he passed away not too long ago. And I heard a testimony of him. One of the staff guys were, were talking. And, you know, he was, I think, uh, 75, 76. And, uh, you know, he'd been weak and illness and whatnot. And um, he, he had told the guy that picked him up he was going to go preach that Sunday. And he said, man, I, I was so weak this morning, I couldn't even button my shirt. And he said, I just, it's, it's, I'm having a hard time just, just standing, just going. But he told the young man, he said, but wait until it's time to preach. And wait, wait and watch what God does when I stand behind the pulpit. God will fill me with power. And he'll give me the power that I need. And uh, that's so very true. Whenever we are running short and low and the gas tank is empty, God always gives us the power. He always gives us what we need. And I told somebody earlier you know, we, our memory verse for, in our Sunday school class is God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so often we have the spirit of fear. Fear fills us. But God says, I want to fill you with something else. I want to fill you with power. And can I tell you, that's what we all need tonight. We all need power. We need the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God's Word. And when we come into a place like this and we sing songs about the Lord, we open up God's Word, we're asking God to fill us with His power. Nothing else is going to help us. Nothing else that's going to strengthen us like the power of God and God's Word. Luke chapter 13 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, or bowed together, whichever one you want to use, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord then turned and said to him, Thou hypocrite, doeth not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, Lo, these eighteen years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Can we pray? Father, thank you. Lord, you are a miracle-working God. I love to read of your miracles. Lord, we thank you for your power and for your grace. Lord, we do certainly need your power. And Lord, we need your spirit. We need your strength. Lord, we need miracles in our own lives. Every single man and woman here, Lord, there is a miracle that they need. There is something that has bound them, that has scarred them, that has hurt them. Lord, they need freedom from. God, maybe there's somebody listening on radio. Lord, they need something from you. Lord, we do pray your presence, your power be given to us this hour. In Christ's name, amen. I want to speak just a few moments on the idea of being bent but not broken. Being bent but not broken. I grew up, um, you know, on a piece of property about three acres. My Grandma and my grandpa, you know, they lived in a house, and uh, my mom and, and uh, boys, you know, we lived in a trailer, and, and cousins lived in, or, you know, aunt and uncle lived in another trailer, or aunt and uncle lived in another trailer. So, there's, you know, there's, there's family all over the place. And there on the back 
part of the property where, where the little single wide, you know, mobile homes at, uh, had uh, two cousins, and uh, their mom and dad bought them a trampoline. How many of you like jumping on the trampoline? <laughs> Man, we loved it. And, uh, you know, I, had three, I have three older brothers, and, you know, we'd all go back there, and all of our cousins, I mean, we had a slew of cousins, you know. We all hanged out, you know, right there in that same general area, and we'd go back there, and we'd start jumping on the trampoline, and, man, it was, uh, it was so much fun. How many of you know what a double bounce is? Double bounce, you know, whenever you hit that, boom, and then, boom, and they go straight up. Man, that was so much fun until somebody broke an arm. Then it was not fun. But I was always amazed on the trampoline. I would, you know, I'd watch my brother, especially my oldest brother, Philip. I, I, I enjoyed watching him because he could, he was, he's the daredevil, still the daredevil, but he would, he would be bouncing on a trampoline and he would do a backflip. Boom, hit it and do a backflip. Boom, same spot. He would just hit, boom, boom, boom. And he would just do that. He's just amazing, amazing guy what he could do with his body. During the summer times, we would go and uh, we, we were, uh, a, you know, a member of this pool club or whatever, and we would go swimming. There was a low dive and there was a, a high dive. And, uh, and my, like I said, my brother, man, he was a, a daredevil, and he would get up there on the high dive, and, man, he would jump on that high dive, and he would, he would do a double front flip. He would, he would try a double back flip. And I thought, man, look how awesome that is. You know, everybody's like, oh, man, Phil, that's awesome. I, it was, you know, all this, I was like, I'm, I'm going to try it. <laughs> you know the rest of the story, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I said, I'm going to do a front flip. Man, I got up there, and I, I was so nervous about like I am now. And I got up there, and I said, and I tried to do a front flip, and I landed flat on my back. And that is the last time I tried to do a front flip. But it's amazing. I love to see. I love to see people you know, do all those flips. You know, I, 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 you know, we went to the circus. What is it, Barlam and Bailey Circus, whatever it used to be, you know. And, man, people were doing all the, all the crazy stuff. And it was so much, so much fun. And our kids, you know, they were in uh, gymnastics whenever they were younger. And, uh, you know, we the same thing. We'd see kids flipping and tumbling and, and uh, back bends. You know, uh, Clara, she was all about the old back bend. You want to try it? No, okay. Man, she was all about the back bend. There were, there were girls there that they could do that, the back somersault, handspring, whatever it is. I mean, all around. How, how many of you ever seen somebody do that? They just go all around the room doing back flip. I'm just dizzy watching them. And there was a girl that could do the back bend, and she could walk doing the back bend. That's a, that's a weird looking thing. That's a creepy looking thing, you know. Somebody bends their bends back like that, right there, you know. I, I, would, I would break something if I tried to do something like that. And it's cool to see somebody like that, but we have somebody here in this story. They were bent like that, but not on purpose. And this lady here, we see that she was bent. She was bent not backwards, but, but she was bent forward. The Bible says that uh, she was bent together. She was bowed together and in no wise could lift herself up. We're going to look here in verse number 11. I want to give you just a few points, and then we'll go on home. The Bible says in verse number 11, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. 18 years. Spirit of infirmity. This word spirit in the Greek is uh, uh, pneuma, like uh, pneumonia. It means a current of air, a blast, or a breeze. The primary sense of the word is to rush or to drive. Numa. We were over here helping um, uh, Brother Dennis. They were putting up some plywood uh, yesterday and put up a wall, him and Brother Joe. We picked that thing up and, you know, we we're trying to, you know, screw it in where it all needed to be screwed in. But then we got plywood, it's thin little sheets of plywood. And we got that plywood up there and we didn't screw it in, but we shot it. We shot it with a nail gun. And another name for a nail gun is pneumatic tools, right? A pneumatic gun. It's whenever a, a blast of air just comes across and pushes the nail slap into the wood. It was just like that. The spirit, the high pressure of air. And then I looked up this word infirmity. Infirmity means a weakness, sickness, or a defect in the body. So this woman, for 18 years, has had a push, a force of weakness, of defect, of bondage, of pain. 18 years 
a spirit of infirmity, something that's been pressing on her, something that's been driving her further and further and further and further down. A spirit of infirmity. Something got a hold of her, you'd say. But I want you to look in verse number 16, and we see it's not a something, but it's a someone. The Bible says, Jesus speaks, and ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom, what's the next word? Satan hath bound. Lo, these 18 years. He says, Satan has bound this woman. Satan has, has, has been the spirit of infirmity, has been pushing on this woman further and further and further. We all know that we have this enemy, don't we? Ephesians 6, 12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Can I tell you, your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your preacher. Your enemy is not your children. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not even the government. Amen? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We have an enemy, and he's found in verse number 16. So how do we prepare for our enemy? He tells us in the next verse. Look at verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have done all to stand. Stand therefore. You say, Brother Donnie, I can't stand. I'm like that woman just bent over, just hurting in pain. He says, just stand there. Having your loins girt about with truth. How, how are we going to face Satan with truth? And have on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you, you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We all understand we have an enemy. And to make it even more clear, he says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Hey, I got news for you. Whenever you look around, there's people that's kind of in your face and there's situations and, there, and there's pressure constantly pushing down on you. Can I tell you, your enemy is not the individual, but your enemy is right here. He's the devil. And the devil can absolutely beat you down. Just like this poor woman has been beat down. And I don't know the situation. We don't have the information here in the Word of God. It doesn't say that the woman was in sin. It doesn't say that she was uh, born that way. We have no idea. All we know is for 18 years, Satan has just grabbed a hold of her and has pressed her further and further and further down where she cannot get up. Have you ever been there? Where you feel like you just can't get up? Like you just can't move? Like no matter how high the sun rises, it's always dark. How many of you have been there? Absolutely. Can I tell you, can I tell you, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear this lion. He's just a roaring lion. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 17, the Bible says, Notwithstanding the Lord said to me, this is Paul talking, The Lord stood with me, and the Lord strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the what? The lion. He's real. He roars. He's big and he's strong. But can I tell you, our Lord is right there. And the Bible says He will deliver you out of the mouth of the lion. You may be facing a spirit of infirmity. Something or someone has weakened you, but you don't have to remain in your weak condition. You don't have to continue being bound by sin or crippled by fear or bent over in defeat. Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. The Bible says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, the spirit of infirmity, the spirit of shame, the spirit of regret, the spirit of defeat. He says, You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see that? I want you to look real close. 
There's two words in there. You see them? They're the same words, but they're different. The word is spirit. Same word, right? What's a different word, right? What's the difference? Yeah. The first spirit has a lowercase s. Amen? The first spirit has a lowercase s. But the second spirit has a uppercase s. Amen? Our spirit of infirmity, our bondage, our struggle, our force, the thing that's pressing down upon us often. Can I tell you, it's a, it's a little s. And I know sometimes it feels like a, a great big s. But can I tell you, no matter how big our s spirit of infirmity gets, can I tell you, the s in the spirit called the Holy Spirit is a whole lot bigger. No doubt about it. My friend, no matter what infirmity we are going through, no matter how bad it gets, can I tell you, it's never as big as God. Never. God is always bigger. Let's look. Verse number 12, we see the champion, not just the cause of her conflict, but the champion of her conflict. I'm going to move this down maybe a little bit, brother. You may have to turn me back up. I'm going to move this down. The champion of her conflict in verse number 12. The Bible says that when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Isn't that what you want? Absolutely. Verse number 13, And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Hey, that's our champion. Look what he did. The Bible says that first of all, Jesus saw her. The Bible says when Jesus saw her, I can tell you, sometimes we feel alone. Sometimes we feel abandoned. Sometimes we feel like even in a room full of people, nobody's paying us any mind. Nobody cares about us. Nobody's interested in us. This poor woman's been like this for 18 years, possibly going to the, the same church, the same synagogue, been around the same people. And she feels like, man, I'm just here all alone. But then one day Jesus comes and he says, Hey, <laughs> woman, come on over here. Jesus saw her. Jesus took note of her. Just like Jesus saw the hungry multitude and had compassion on them and fed them. Remember that? Just like whenever Jesus told the disciples, hey, I, I, I'm going to force you guys upon the boat and I'm going to force you out there into the middle of a storm. And the Bible says whenever it was dark and when it was like in the middle of the night and whenever he saw them toiling and working and struggling, the Bible says he saw them and he went to them. Jesus saw the woman at the well in Samaria and gave her living water. Jesus saw Mary and Martha with a broken heart. Jesus saw Lazarus dead in the tomb, but he went to their rescue. He saw them. It's a great comfort for me personally to know that I have a personal God that sees me. He sees you. I know there are times in your life, just like mine, I feel like nobody's watching. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking. But Jesus sees you. He saw John the Baptist, didn't he? In the in the prison. He saw Peter in the prison. He saw Paul in the prison. He saw Adoniram Judson in the prison. He saw John Bunyan in the prison. He saw John the Revelator over in the Isle of Patmos all by himself. He, he saw all these folks in their prison. And can I tell you, he can see you in yours. He saw her. Next, he calls to her. This lady has been looked over. I'm sure she is a sight to see. She has all bent over. I'm sure she's not well kept. I'm sure she don't have her hair done. I'm sure she ain't got her makeup on. I'm sure she's not wearing the right kind of clothes. I'm sure she doesn't look the right way. I'm sure she don't smell the right way. I'm sure she don't have a Bible in her hand. And she comes in, and nobody says a word. She walks right past Jesus, and Jesus sees her in her spirit of infirmity. And he calls out. He says, woman, on over here. He calls to get her attention and then he calls her to himself. When's the last time 
that you've heard Jesus speak to you. I want you to think, when is the last time, honestly, that you heard Jesus speak to you? When's the last time you heard His, his voice? When's the last time you heard His whisper? The last time that we spent time with the Lord. Can I tell you, there's often times that we will pray. There's often times that we'll, we'll shout out to heaven. But when's the last time we've heard heaven shout back to us? When have you heard His voice? I can I tell you, this woman heard Him. And she rejoiced. I want to encourage you. Put your ear. Put your ear close and hear His voice. Our kids, they're grown now. But I remember whenever they were in the nursery. And in that church where we were at, you, had, you walked in the door, you had the nurseries there, and then you walked into the auditorium. And I don't care how loud the preacher was. going to tell you, and he was loud. He was, a, he was one of them preachers. Hey, hey, and all this kind of thing. You know, he was loud. And can I tell you, while we're listening to the preaching and we're all zoned in, if there was a cry from the nursery, our ears perked up. And all the babies that were in the nurseries and all the cries that you could hear, there, if, if one of our children cried, we knew it. We, we heard it. Our ears would perk up and we would look at each other and then I was off the duty. <laughs> Just kidding. I did change some diapers. Yeah, I did. I did. Not many. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But can I tell you, we understood. We, we, we heard the voice of our children. And Jesus hears and knows our voice as well. And he calls to this woman. He says, hey, I want you to come on over here. I got something special for you. Not only does he see her and he calls out to her, then he touches her. The Bible says he saw her, he called to her, and then said unto the woman, thou, uh, woman, thou art loose from the infirmity, and laid his hands on her. Think about this. Think about who Jesus is. Jesus is God in the flesh. Think about where those hands have been. Think about the power that's in those hands. Think about all that God has done with his hands. Those same hands reached out and touched this poor, sad, broken woman. Those same hands that touched the blind eyes and made them whole. Those same, same hands that took the five loaves and, the, and the, uh, uh, or the, the, yeah, five loaves and two fishes, amen? I was, just, I was just seeing if you guys knew. Those same hands touched her. The same hands that took the... <laughs> The ear that fell off that dude's head. Those same hands. I'm going to tell you, whatever touches you, touches him. Whatever bothers you, bothers him. Whatever, what, whatever kind of infirmity, whatever kind of struggle, whatever kind of force or push or strain that you face, can I tell you, he feels it. How do we know that? Because the Bible says it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, the Bible says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be, what? Touched. With the, feel, with the feeling of our, what? Infirmities. He says, hey, we have a God that whenever you are touched and you are pressed and you are pushed and you are bound, He says, hey, that same God feels that. He knows what you're going through is what He's saying. Those same infirmities, He's also touched. He cares that much for you that He would touch you. And then He heals her. The Bible says immediately she was made straight. At that very moment. It's not often that Jesus delays. Praise the Lord for that. I can tell you, it's often it's us that delays. It's me that, that will delay. It's me that will delay going to the Lord. It's me that will delay to, to beseech Him. It's me that will belay, uh, delay to really get into the presence of the Lord. It's really me that delays. But often we'll say, God, where are you? Don't you see where we are? Don't you see the, the pain that I'm in and the torture that I'm in and the pressure that I'm under? And we'll say, God, where are you? But can I tell you, it's not the Lord that delays. It's often us. We are the ones that delays and often strays from the presence of the Lord. I remember... When I was a, a kid, I'm sure like you, you rode your bicycle and 
you did some crazy stuff, you tried to jump, you know, the, the ramp, or you tried to, you know, do some slide out or whatever, and you fell and you scraped your arm. I, I can remember as a little kid, you know, riding my bike and getting my knees scraped up or my elbows scraped up, and I'd go in there and I'd be crying. I'd say, Mama, Mama, look, look what I did. And there'd be blood all coming down, and she'd grab a hold of my, and I'd be just, <laughs> I was so worked up, you know, I wanted Mama to, to fix it. You know, Mama can fix it. Amen? She can fix it. Well, there's sometimes I didn't want Mama to fix it. Sometimes Mama would look at that thing and she'd say, oh, let me get you a Band-Aid, baby. But then sometimes, if it was bad enough, Mama would say, follow me. Yeah. Where are we going, Mama? We're going to the bathroom. Why are we going to the bathroom? And now, now all of a sudden, I stopped crying. I was <laughs> And now I ain't saying nothing. Now I'm like, what are we going to do in there? And she said, baby, I got to clean that. Mm. Mm, I feel it. I feel it even today. I got to clean that. There's dirt in there. There's little pebbles in there, baby. I got to get that out. Mama, like, that's going to hurt. I, I got to get I got to get all that stuff out. And I, and I said, what, what are you going to do after that? She said, well, I got to pour some alcohol on it. I got to pour some of that peroxide in there. It may, be, it may get infected. You may lose your arm. You know what I was doing? I was backpedaling then. At first, I was crying, coming to Mama, Mama, please help me. This, this hurts so bad. This bad. And now I'm saying, Mama, get away from me. Don't touch me, Mama. And I think about this woman that had this infirmity for 18 years bent over. Think about that. Bowed together. That means they, they, it, they, she was touching. Boom. You can look that up. For 18 years. Think about how her muscles and her ligaments and tendons and bones. Think about how that had to have just like just kind of locked in place. The Bible says she could not stand up. And then the Bible says this, and immediately she stood straight up. Now I want you to think about that. 18 years like this. And then all of a sudden, whoop, like that. How many of you, whenever you go to sleep at night, you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, when you get up out of bed? Ah. Now imagine 18 years. Here's the point. Often we want God to fix our problems, but without the pain. This woman had been bent over for 18 years. She wanted to be normal. She wanted to stand up, but she wasn't normal. She wasn't regular. She wasn't like everybody else. And she wanted to be healed. And I wonder how painful it was when Jesus touched her. I wonder how painful it must have been whenever Jesus withdrew that infirmity and allowed her to stand up straight and tall. The truth is, sometimes a remedy hurts. Truth is, sometimes what we really honestly need is something that's painful. And God has to bring that in our path. So He heals her. Next, in verse number 14, we see the challenge of the conflict. There's a challenge. This blows my mind. These Pharisees are idiots. I mean, just straight up idiots. Is that okay if I say that? All right. Verse number 14, And the ruler of the synagogue, the dude in charge, answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, but not on the Sabbath day. The, the ruler of the synagogue begins to argue with Jesus. Wouldn't you think if you saw a miracle, no doubt this woman had been in this synagogue, in synagogue before. No doubt he had seen her coming in. Hey, Miss So-and-so, go and have a seat over there in the back. Nobody wants to see you. No doubt he saw her, and no doubt he saw Jesus heal her, and now he wants to argue about how Jesus works a miracle. It blows my mind. And there's a challenge now we see. He challenges the Lord. Who is he to argue with the one that's performed a miracle? This, this guy had done nothing with this woman in 18 years. But now he's going to act like he has authority over the Lord. 
Here's the challenge. And here's my challenge to you. Who is going to run the show in your life? That's the question. Who is going to run the show here? Is it going to be Jesus or is it going to be the ruler? He didn't like Jesus running the program at church. He didn't like Jesus interfering with what he wanted to do amongst the people in the church. I'm going to tell you, we do the same thing. Often Jesus will want to move and He'll want to work and He'll want to, he'll want to uh, adjust us and we say, whoa, whoa, whoa right there, tiger. Not that. Don't touch that. That's mine. Don't, don't, don't mess with that. That's, I've had that for a long time, Jesus. No, 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 don't, don't mess with that. I like that. That's, that's my favorite. Let me ask you, who's going to be, the, who's going to be running the show? Who's going to be running the show at your house? Who's going to be running the show for your family? Who's going to be running the show at your church? Who's going to be the ruler of your life, young people? Who's going to tell you what to do? When we surrender to God, we let go of our attachment of how things happen on the outside. And we become more concentrated on what's happening on the inside. When we surrender fully to the Lord, and we say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be the ruler of my life, then no longer are we going to really concern ourselves with the things that we see out here and the issues that we're facing out here and the circumstances that we have all around us. And we're just going to say, Lord, whatever you have to do to straighten me up, whatever you have to do to release the pressure, to take that pain from me, whatever you have to do, Lord, you are the ruler of my life. This man said, you're not going to be ruling here. Jesus, you're not going to tell me what to do in my house. What, know you not that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, we tell the Lord, no, you're not going to do that in His house. Are you willing to surrender to the how? We want a detailed deport, uh, report on how Jesus is going to work in our lives, and that's not surrender. Sometimes Jesus spoke the miracles and they happened and sometimes Jesus broke things and miracles happened. My question is, will you be surrendered to the how of Jesus? The how. Let's pray. Father, I don't know why. I don't know why you really care. I don't, I don't know why that you would concern yourself with some broken down woman. I don't know why you'd concern yourself with a broken down guy. But I'm so thankful that you do. Lord, we want to praise you tonight. Lord, for seeing where we are. Not just where we are, but where I am personally and where they are personally. I thank you, Lord, for knowing my name and calling me to you. I thank you for your touch that you've had in my life and many times over. And I praise you. What a great opportunity now in the quietness of the moment, Lord, that we would praise you. Lord, I know there are many here, their backs are bent. They're hurting, they're struggling, and Lord, they need a touch from you. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you are greater than the spirit of our infirmity. You're bigger. Your S is bigger. And I'm so thankful. God, touch us. Help us to surrender. Surrender to you, however and whatever we have to do. May we simply just obey you, whatever the issue is. Before the piano plays, maybe there's something going on in your life. You say, Brother Donnie, I, I have something, a, a, a spirit of infirmity, something that's pressuring me, 
something that's pushing me down, and you'd raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Anybody here like that? Yeah, I see your hand. I see that hand. I want to encourage you. Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. He cares. Our pianist is going to play. If you'd like to come and spend some time with the Lord, praising the Lord, pleading with the Lord. Now's your time. Stand to your feet. Let's sing. Let's pray. Let's praise. Come every soul by sin.